Hi. Today I'll be talking about gin, an alcoholic drink that's been popular in the palaces of kings and queens and drunk by the poorest urban mob that would bring one of Europe's greatest cities to its knees. Gin bottles, or fragments thereof, are regularly found in archaeological sites around the world and are thus of interest to archaeologists. Gin was originally distilled by the Dutch in the 13th century for medicinal purposes, made to treat stomach complaints, gout and gallstones, good for the kidneys. It was called Yeniva, a juniper-flavoured spirit originally distilled from malt wine, and still produced today in quantity. The English word gin derives from the Flemish word Yeniva, which itself comes from the word juniper. London dry gin is distinguished from true Dutch Yeniva, as Yeniva is sweeter. A variant called Old Tom Gin sits in between the two extremes. The word Yeniva, sometimes spelt Geneva, was used interchangeably with the term Dutch Gin, and I'm grouping the drinks together under the umbrella term of Gin for the purpose of this video and my sanity. Gin was brought back to England by mercenaries who were fighting for the Dutch in the Thirty Years' War, and their fondness for the spirit was the origin for the term Dutch Courage. Gin became the most popular drink of the urban poor, and distilleries were established in ever-increasing numbers. Much of the cheap, locally-made gin was really low-quality rock gut, sometimes using turpentine rather than juniper for flavouring. A wide array of fruits and spices are used besides the traditional juniper berry to flavour gin, and I imagine there are plenty of things that would taste better than turpentine. But turpentine is cheap! So while the English were drinking turpentine, the Dutch Yeniva industry had its own issues. In 1601, distilling had been banned by Archdukes Albert and Isabella in the southern Netherlands. Hasselt escaped this ban because it was part of the bishopric of Liege, and Yeniva production there took off when it was occupied by Dutch troops between 1675 and 1681. Austrian rule would restore the distilling industry to the south in 1713, and from then on it would get more and more industrialised. The Dutch East India Company, of which Lucas Bowles, a famous distiller, was a major shareholder, would succeed in spreading Dutch gin around the world. Returning to England, King Charles I, before he lost his head, established the Worshipful Company of Distillers, who had the sole right to distill spirits in the London area. This improved both the quality of English gin and its public image. However, its monopoly was broken in 1690. William of Orange actively encouraged English distilleries, which combined with the high import duties laid on French brandy due to conflict with France, and the practice of distributing gin to workers as part of their wages, saw the volume of gin in England overtake that of beer and ale. This was not without its social consequences. Concern with widespread public drunkenness saw waves of legislation to try to remedy it. In 1729, the British government introduced an excise licence of £20 and charged two shillings per gallon as duty. This had the result of suppressing distilleries producing good gin, but the demand for cheap rocka continued to grow. This ongoing consumption of strong liquor, principally by the urban poor, had created issues that the aristocracy could not ignore. Lord Hervey, the Lord Privy Seal, wrote, Drunkenness of the common people was universal. The whole town of London swarmed with drunken people from morning till night. Hmm. The government's solution to this was the Gin Act of 1736 that put a heavy duty tax on gin in Britain, 20 shillings per gallon, which made it prohibitively expensive. At the time, 11 million gallons of gin was distilled annually. Riots broke out over this law, and it was widely and openly broken to the point that gin production was up by almost 50% six years after the Gin Act was passed. This complete failure resulted in the Gin Act being repealed in 1742. The British government worked with the distillers to develop a new policy, culminating the Gin Act of 1751, which saw an end to small gin shops, reasonably, as opposed to astronomically, high prices, and an improvement in the quality of gin. As a result, gin gradually became a much more respectable drink, and ascended back into popularity with high society. The image I showed earlier by William Hogarth entitled Gin Lane was produced at the time to promote the 1751 Gin Act, with the caption, Gin cursed fiend with fury fraught makes human race a prey. It enters by a deadly draught and steals our life away.
This was contrasted with an image of Bear Street, showing happy and healthy people, including a blacksmith holding a Frenchman in one hand and a bear in the other, with the caption, Bear, happy produce of our isle, can sinewy strength impart, and wearied with fatigue and toil can cheer each manly heart. If you're wondering why the rhymes in the poems don't quite work, I suggest you check out Metatron's video on the Great Vowel Shift. In the 1820s, gin had a renaissance in Britain, and lavish pubs were established called gin palaces. They became really popular throughout the 19th century. Their garish style outlived the temporary resurgence of gin popularity. Up until the 1870s, most of the gin produced was distributed directly from the cask in taverns and gin palaces, leaving relatively little in the way of material culture for archaeologists to study. Dutch yenever was traditionally bottled in tall, salt-glazed stoneware bottles pictured here, and some brands still use similar bottles today. Yenever travelled with Dutch Navy and Dutch East Indiamen alike, and Irvin Lucas Bowles and Hulstkamp, Zoon and Mollen were prolific exporters using these traditional bottles. English gins tend to be bottled in generic, clear, cylindrical bottles, such as these old Tom gin bottles found in Wanganui with their labels still intact. These bottles are not normally much help to archaeologists, as unless the label survives as they had there, they could have contained any sort of spirit. As I mentioned in my medicines video, Udolpho Wolf's aromatic schnapps was little more than Dutch gin with extra juniper berry juice added, and was sold worldwide in these hefty rectangular green glass bottles. My personal favourite gin bottle found worldwide is the Dutch case gin bottle, and their widespread distribution is a consequence of Dutch dominance in the bottled gin market. The type of bottle dates back as far as the early to mid 17th century. Examples were found in the Dutch shipwreck Zeewick, which was wrecked off the Australian coast in 1727. This one here was found in the trench of an 1850s Maori gunfighter par. This type of bottle was so synonymous with quality gin that it was imitated by bottlers in Britain and America. As you can see, there are no seam lines from the mould in this bottle. It was made using a dip mould, a one-piece mould that the bottle was blown into. This means that the shoulder is completely free-blown. The slight taper is to facilitate removal from the mould. As the 19th century wears on, the use of multi-part moulds allowed embossed lettering, finer chamfered edges, and better formed shoulders. Sometimes a ribbed texture to the glass, as bottle mould technology improved. They come in a variety of colours, but are typically made from olive green glass, which we'd call black glass if it was a bit thicker, but case gins tend to be quite thin glass as the contents do not have to withstand any pressure. Sometimes glass seals, formed in the same way as a wax seal, using a blob of molten glass and a metal stamp, will be placed on the shoulder with the company's logo. After being individually blown into the mould, the glass blower forms the top. The common top on these early bottles was a rolled lip, produced by heating the sheared top and spreading it out while rotating the bottle. This type of bottle has the colloquial name pig snout, due to the distinctive top. Later 19th century bottles have a tooled finish to the top formed using a specialist tool into a much more evenly shaped regular top. The reason behind the rectangular shape was pure efficiency. The bottles would be packed into wooden cases with minimal wasted space. These cases could then be exported worldwide, with minimal chance of the bottles rattling around in the case and breaking. The demand for Dutch gin and its successful international distribution is the reason why these bottles are so common in 19th century sites. Gin's original reputation as a medicinal drink was destroyed in the gin craze and riots of the 1700s. It lost the wholesome facade that it had at its Dutch roots, and was simply considered hard liquor. This was almost certainly the reason why Udolpho Wolf marketed his gin as aromatic schnapps, instead of what it actually was. The East India Company, who had privatised imperialism in India, were faced with the wrath of malaria, and the only known treatment for it was quinine which was produced from the bark of the South American cinchona tree, a valuable commodity in itself. The problem was quinine tastes bitter and disgusting. Modern tonic water only has minimal amounts of quinine in it compared to the medicinal doses used at the time. 
soldiers were provided with the gin ration already, and the idea of combining the quinine with water, gin, sugar and lime to make it more palatable made perfect sense. An increasing number of British regiments served in India following the Indian mutiny, and with these regiments getting shuffled around the vast empire, the cocktail was spread around the world. The only other gin cocktail I see any reason to mention is the martini. A mixture of gin and vermouth, which is kind of an Italian aromatic fortified wine. Stirred together with ice cubes, unless you're James Bond that is. The early mixtures were equal parts gin and vermouth. However, now it's normal to have six parts gin to one part vermouth. And Noel Coward, a notable gin drinker, famously said, A perfect martini should be made by filling a glass with gin and then waving it in the general direction of Italy. Which, since we're in New Zealand, I'm guessing would be down? You have to wonder why he didn't just drink it straight from the bottle. The history of the martini is pretty murky, but it appears to have been invented in the mid to late 19th century. I hope this video has served to illustrate the highs and lows of the history of gin, as well as presenting the material culture associated with it. Thanks for watching. Please share, comment and subscribe. Cheers.